In this video, I will continue with our discussion of pressure and then we will look at the vapor pressure and as I mentioned in my previous video that both of these properties are actually very important fluid properties and um, we need to have a good understanding of ex exactly how uh, what they represent and uh, so we actually looked at the uh, one of the examples that we did before let me just uh, bring this out here so we looked at the manometer which was a device um, to measure the pressure of a liquid or a gas and then in this case I was taking this to be a gas and then um, this pressure was exerted over here and which should be the same as if you have the same fluid so this pressure has to be same as what this fluid will experience over here so I can make this to be any reference line and based on that I can um, I can do my force balance or um, how the, the pressure is changing inside the liquid. So anytime we go down in the liquid we basically have to add the pressure anytime we go up we basically reduce the pressure and, and that's the same idea when we were looking at the, the fluid um, you go down in the fluid you basically the pressure increases by rho GH and as you go up the pressure decreases by rho GH so the same idea applies when we are moving inside the column of the fluid and um, it's the even though it's a pressure but most of the time it's defined in terms of the height of the uh, fluid uh, most uh, it usually is the uh, height of the mercury column but you can have um, you can define it in any fluid as long as you know the specific weight and we talked about that in case of a water um, for the same amount of atmospheric pressure 760 millimeter of, of Hg for water it will be somewhere around 10 meters so that's why you don't use water um, but you can certainly use it if you want to okay so now I'm gonna look at uh, if I want to find the, the the pressure difference between two fluids so let's just take take a look at it uh, I have a fluid over here fluid A uh, in, in this case um, fluid both gases and um, liquid but I'm taking this to be a liquid because I want to also add its weight if it's a gas then I don't have to worry about the the, um, the specific weight and the height column of the gas and then I also have uh, another fluid which is B so I'm make let me make this as a liquid and this is also a liquid otherwise I don't if it's a gas then I don't have to worry about this but I want to find the pressure difference PA minus PB so PA we start out over here then we will look we go up to the same height then if you have the same fluid that's flowing down this way I mean it's, it's the same fluid that has a height H1 so I'm going to add this gamma 1 times H1 because that's the specific weight of this fluid then the fluid actually changes okay so in this case I actually am using um, this as my reference as I pointed out I can basically choose any reference I can choose this as a reference or some other thing as a reference okay so now we have gamma 1 times H1 so now this pressure which will be exerted by PA and gamma 1 H1 has to be same as what's being felt by this fluid over here so this is fluid 2 and in fact yeah let me call this gamma 3 and this is gamma 2 so it's a different fluid so gamma 2 times H2 because we are going up in the um, in the height of the fluid column so it will be gamma 2 times H2 and then we are moving into the third fluid which is gamma 3 times the H3 so gamma 3 times the H3 and then we went back I mean up till this point and this has to be equals to PB or I can simply write this as PB equals to zero because we have balanced these two pressures so PA minus PB all of this can be actually on this side and uh, I will have to I thought I, I did it right but now I changed some of the properties uh, this this is the specific weight of the first fluid gamma 2 is second fluid and third fluid so now when I take it on the other side PA minus PB is equals to gamma 1 H1 um, plus gamma 2 H2 plus gamma 3 H3 okay so if I know 
the specific weights um, and the heights I can find out the pressure difference between the two fluids so this device is a manometer or a YouTube manometer which actually um, tells you the pressure and again as I pointed out you can basically take any line as a reference you just have to add this distance but as you notice you have to also subtract the same distance from the same reference line so I will choose um, I tend to choose the same liquid where it when it's um, going to a different liquid so over here and over here so so let's actually um, do an example so find the uh, the pressure inside this um, container which is being connected to a YouTube manometer and it's open to the environment so you have the atmospheric pressure and um, as I pointed out if the gas don't worry about the height of the gas column so in this ca in, in that case if it's a gas you don't have to worry about this height column of the fluid but then you have to definitely worry about this one over here so this I can make these line equal so now I want to measure the um, the pressure in the air, uh, the water so PA which actually starts out here and then we have plus gamma of water times I have 0.15 plus gamma of water and um, 0.25 and I'm choosing this to be my reference line as I pointed out I can choose anything as my reference line but I'm choosing this to be my reference line and then this pressure is same as this pressure over here so it will be minus gamma times of mercury um, HGO um, times height of that which is 0.25 meters minus P atmospheric is equals to zero so if I'm only looking at the gauge pressure um, for this water then I can certainly take this to be equals to zero so in fact um, so P atmospheric I am actually going to call it zero um, Pascal um, gauge so because it doesn't have anything uh, in terms of the gauge it's the atmospheric pressure so I'm gonna basically neglect that so PA is equals to um, so if I take it on the other side which will actually make this quantity gamma of H2 HGO which is the mercury which is 132.8 kilonewton um, so the specific gravity of the mercury is given here so which is 132.8 kilonewton meter cube times um, 0.25 meters and then I also have minus 9.81 kilonewton per meter cube times 0.4 meters Okay, and then we have we don't have anything to do with the atmospheric pressure, so I added these two, and in the end, this gives us the pressure equals to um, 33.2 kilonewton per meter square minus 3.92 kilonewton per meter square, and this gives me 29.28 uh, kilonewton per meter square, which actually is also kilopascals so and this is my gauge pressure okay so you can simply measure the gauge pressure based on um, a device like this a manometer okay so a quick comment um, as I mentioned these are very primitive devices a barometer a manometer most of the time um, and um, I mean I will just talk about some of the devices that are used to measure pressures um, this is a multi-fluid manometer uh, use different liquids so they don't mix and we did um, do an example I, I mean in terms of you can have water you can have mercury you can have oil you just want to make sure that the two fluids that you are using or three or four fluids they don't mix with each other okay so that you can easily read their readings so you don't want to mix uh, an oil with another oil 
um, so there has to be a different sort of liquid. Inclined manometers for more precision. So the idea with those are you can have actually, as I mentioned over here, I mean, I didn't mention, but like something like this, like it's a manometer, but now it's more inclined. So you will have some angle. So, I mean, you will have a little bit more increments there. So you just, I mean, the idea is the procedure is the same. Now you will have to worry about the, if this is your angle, so you will take the, um, the cosine of that and then you will balance it with the weight. So it's just that it will give you more increments and it will be easier for read and it will be more precise. Um, but, but these two devices, people use it, but they are getting kind of obsolete. One of the most common, commonly used device um, these days is called a Borden tube or a Borden gauge. And the way this works is um, you have this coil. Okay, so I mean this is a coil. Um, it can have more than, I mean right now I just showed you one turn, but it has multiple turns. And, um, and so what happens is as soon as you connect this with a high pressure source, this coil tries to open up open up okay so I mean it will it will change and to that coil there is this needle that's connected so this is on the back side this is on the front side so when this coil tries to open this needle actually moves and it shows you the gauge pressure um, most of those Borden gauges or Borden tubes are actually calibrated at the atmospheric pressure so they will only show you the gauge pressure but if you calibrate this in complete vacuum, then when you take it out, it will show you the atmospheric pressure, and it will, and you, when you have an additional pressure above atmospheric, then it will show you the absolute pressure. So it depends on how you calibrate this. So that's how actually it works. And it's not only the coils; you can have some twist type uh, um, uh, Borden uh, gauges also. So, but, but the idea is the same that it will change and there is needle connected and the needle will move and it will show you the, the gauge pressure. Um, some other which are getting more common these days and in fact pretty common is known as the pressure transducers. They convert the pressure effect to an electrical effect such as charge in voltage, resistance or capacitance. So anytime you have a change in voltage, resistance, capacitance you can simply read read it um, through a volt I mean through a voltmeter or something and it will tell you how much the change was in the pressure. Piezoelectric transducers when pressure is applied to a piezoelectric material a charge is developed. So the idea is I mean anytime um, something changes in the environment you can actually use piezoelectric to measure uh, temperature differences, humidity uh, differences and so on. So piezoelectric transducer, transducer anytime there is a change a charge will be developed and that charge can be correlated to um, changes in the pressure so pretty neat devices um, okay so that's um, what I wanted to talk about the, the pressure and another thing is the pre why pressure is an important quantity in fact we looked at um, some of the applications the density will be less in, in the cases of uh, when you are talking about the air but the idea is the fluid will only move and I did point it out earlier the fluid will only move when you have a pressure difference so if this pressure P2 is greater than P1 only then the fluid will move okay otherwise the fluid won't move so to have a good understanding of how pressure is changing um, it's it's very important and at the same time talking about the stationary fluids as you go down in, in, a, in a lake or an ocean the pressure keeps building up because the pressure is changing rho gh and um, and even if you have to uh, put a gate um, like if you want to build a dam and you want to find out exactly how much force you would require so the, the deeper you will go in the more and more the force would be on, on this uh, object or this gate or this plate so you have to uh, figure those out so the pressure will be extremely high as you will go down in the in the liquid and that's why um, there's uh, still a vast uh, um, 
area in the ocean which is unexplored because the ocean is very deep and there is no device that can actually go in that deep because most other devices uh, I mean if you're submarine or something those are they want to maintain the inside temperature to one atmospheric but when it goes down the pressure keeps on increasing on the device and then they basically um, they collapse I mean of course um, they can go up to a certain depth but they can't go um, to unlimited in depth so which actually some of the places in ocean are um, more than kilometers uh, deep so okay so the next topic is which actually is a very very important topic is called a vapor pressure um, and in fact in the last um, um, video on the pressure one of the examples I said that as you go on the higher elevations the boiling point of the water actually decreases um, so our common perception is if I take um, a beaker of water and I heat it up okay so the water will start boiling at 100 degrees so water will start boiling at 100 degrees um, this statement is true when when I also add this at 100 degrees Celsius and one atmospheric pressure okay so one atmospheric pressure water will start boiling but if I reduce my pressure the water actually starts boiling earlier and um, and this is true for uh, when you go to a uh, mountainous area where the pressure is low as we go higher up in the elevation the, the pressure actually decreases um, so the pressure the water will actually start boiling a lot earlier and at the same time if I increase the pressure inside this container we use pressure cookers so we increase this atmospheric pressure um, I mean the surrounding pressure inside this liquid for this liquid so the the at, uh, the boiling point actually increases so how does the um, uh, I mean so why we are concerned with this in in the fluid mechanics so the reason being okay so before I um, answer that question I I want to relate um, the vapor pressure to the boiling point because we are looking at the boiling point and then we are talking about the vapor pressure so let's actually take a look at it what exactly is a vapor pressure so the idea with the vapor pressure is so let's just take a liquid okay so this could be air I mean this could be water so it's half filled and by the way vapor pressure um, every liquid will have its own vapor pressure okay so uh, I mean when the equilibrium will be reached so some of the water molecules okay so they will have a higher energies and then they will basically try to exit out of the out of the surface okay and that's we also call this evaporation so the water molecules at the surface they have higher energies and they will move out but after a certain time an equilibrium condition will be reached when the number of molecules leaving that surface is same as the number of molecules that are getting in so in, in some ways the number of molecules that are leaving is same as what's coming in so an equilibrium is reached and that point the pressure exerted by that vapor is known as the vapor pressure okay so it varies from liquid to liquid because you can have a stronger bonds between the liquids and then they won't let this um, free molecules or like higher energy molecules to exit out of the surface um, but I mean but all liquids will lose some to the environment some li liquids lose a lot less some do a lot more um, and it's another thing which actually changes with the temperature so the vapor pressure which I'm representing with PV goes up as we increase temperature goes up with the increasing temperature okay so as I increase temperature so basically water will lose more to its uh, from its surface okay so this is the idea which is known as the evaporation okay so and in this case we are adding um, energy I mean we are increasing the temperature the vapor pressure keeps on increasing and um, 
now this is another very powerful statement that I'm going to make now which is boiling occurs boiling occurs when vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure okay and anything um, anything so when vapor pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure we have evaporation vapor pressure is equals to the atmospheric pressure we have the boiling and let me just point this out that the evaporation is a surface phenomena okay so it only occurs through the surface and the boiling is a volumetric phenomenon volume and volumetric phenomenon and <clears throat> so let me go back to this definition again as I said <clears throat> the molecules will try to leave the surface and um, in this case the vapor pressure is less than the atmospheric pressure okay so um, I, I don't know if everybody explains it this way but this is how I understood this when I um, the molecules that are also inside this liquid they some of them have higher energies and they also want to escape I mean so they also want to go to the vapor form but the problem with them is the vapor pressure I mean the, the pressure that the vapor can actually form is less than the atmospheric pressure so even if they want to go and join in, in a vapor that vapor I mean first of all that vapor won't be able to um, they, they won't be able to create a vapor because the atmospheric pressure is a lot more on, on, on those bubbles okay so anytime you have you there is a bubble that wants to be created and then you have a much higher pressure on the outside this bubble will actually collapse so the only way and in fact I shouldn't even um, make those bubbles and then and I, I don't want to give a misconception that those bubbles are made and then they collapse because they can't until the vapor pressure reaches the atmospheric pressure and that's what happens when you have the boiling that the vapor pressure suddenly becomes equals to the atmospheric pressure okay and at that time the bubbles that are formed in here they can basically hold their shape and this is um, something um, as you go down in the fluid okay as you go deeper and deeper down the pressure keeps on increasing and if the pressure keeps on increasing so the idea is if you make a bubble over here um, in order for this bubble to be formed it has to overcome the surrounding pressure and in fact there are some places in the ocean down below where the temperature of the water that they recorded is somewhere around 350 degrees Celsius at such a high temperature the water was still in the liquid form because it was it was under an extreme pressure so at that pressure even if the bubble wants to form outside pressure just collapses that bubble okay so that's the idea that whenever the boiling will happen um, when you have the vapor pressure equals to the atmospheric pressure and you must have um, in some physics class or somewhere somebody would have demonstrated this experiment to you that the consequence of that is so let's just take a beaker of water and I take another container outside and if I start extracting molecules from here so in other words I am reducing the atmospheric pressure for this liquid container so I'm starting to take some molecules so basically creating some vacuum here so you will notice that this um, thing will start boiling at a much much lower temperature so maybe at 25 degrees Celsius you can boil water by reducing atmospheric pressure okay so you can boil water so why are we concerned with this because as I mentioned the fluids will only move when you have changes in the pressure so you have a high pressure you have a low pressure the fluid will move if I make this as a nozzle or like some other device where you have a very I mean high pressure here and now you want to speed up the fluid 
you want to make this pressure as low so that the lower the pressure the faster the fluid will move or the faster the fluid will move this, the lower this pressure has to be so what happens is the lower this pressure would be so for the case of a uh, water if this pressure becomes too low then some of the water molecules actually form vapors okay so they form vapors and they move to some other regions which could be high pressure regions okay so they can after this area so let's suppose if this is uh, some some device like this so at this point they go to a very low pressure but now as you can see this thing is converging and they can basically go to a high pressure region and at that high pressure region those bubbles cannot sustain their shape I mean they basically will collapse because you have a higher pressure over here so the fluid velocity will decrease from here to here but at the same time um, the pressure will increase so the pressure will increase and then the bubbles will actually collapse and as they do collapse they produce a tremendous amount of force okay and that phenomenon um, I mean so they can actually um, they can corrode and they can actually create pits in the in the metals and all that so most of the uh, the turbo machinery like for example pumps um, turbines and um, impellers and, and so many other fluid devices where you have some places you have a high pressure region some places you have a low pressure region so if the bubbles actually um, boil I mean if they they form bubbles and they go to high pressure regions when they collapse they can actually um, damage the equipment and then you will um, so you can so this phenomena actually is called the cavitation okay and you cannot run your equipment for a very long time when it is under uh, cavitation and one simple example I can give you about uh, a centrifugal pump a centrifugal pump actually looks something like this um, where the fluid goes in in this direction and then it basically comes out it spins through those blades okay so it's vertical um, okay and then it basically comes out in, in this direction so now the fluid is moving in this direction and it comes out at 90 degrees from here and the the blades actually increase the um, provide the energy to this water but now if you start increasing the energy um, the rotational speed of the water this fluid will be pushed out okay but at the same time you are there's no liquid left there so you kind of tend to create a vacuum for this fluid that's coming in because more fluid wants to be pushed out than the flow rate that you're providing in so a vacuum region would be created here and anytime the fluid will go to that vacuum region basically they will form vapors because atmospheric pressure the surrounding at pressure reduces they form vapors and when they go into the high pressure region which is right after the tip of the blade they collapse and that causes cavitation and you will hear loud sounds and I mean this is one example but there are a lot of other examples too um, especially anytime if you're using a garden hose okay so you're using a garden hose and you're using the, your thumb to basically block the um, um, the flow that's going out you will if you make it really, really small then you will uh, hear some hissing sounds because what happens is the pressure is um, over this side um, I mean it's as it wants to move faster at this point the pressure is really really low by the time it comes out this over here becomes the atmospheric pressure and you will um, hear those bubble collapse and and um, and even um, the impeller blades um, behind I mean so the impeller blades um, so as it tries to move um, they actually on one side they create um, because they are curved so on one side they basically create a high pressure region on one side they create a low pressure region and then um, some bubbles are formed as they move along this um, uh, this blade and they go from the low pressure region when they are in the bubble form and they go to the high pressure region they collapse and they basically um, destroy the blade so so it's something that uh, very important in fluid mechanics so the idea of the pressure um, which is more general but then when you're looking about talking about the applications 
we also need to keep that in mind that the vapor pressure is a significant um, thing to deal with. Alright, so that's pretty much what I wanted to say about the pressure and the vapor pressure. So, see you guys in um, the next video.